Good to see everyone again, and thanks for coming back. And it's a real pleasure to be with you again. And um, I just want to really say a really th a big thanks um, to, for inviting me to come and speak and having the privilege to study God's Word these last couple of weeks. Today we're going to be uh, continuing in Luke, the passage we've just read. It's quite a long passage. So my plan, uh, as I was praying about what to speak on, is to delve a little bit into the first section, and that's probably where we'll spend most of the time, and then we're going to draw out some general principles from last week and this week, uh, and try and cover the rest of the passage, so we'll see how we get on. Okay, so I want to start off by thinking about um, breakthrough moments. So these are moments when your life changes forever, and I think I've got a couple of examples of these. The moment when a young girl, we're on to tennis again by the way, uh, beats a top seed in an overnight sensation and all of a sudden you're in the quarterfinals or almost of uh, Wimbledon. The moment your boss resigns and you're delivering the country, your country's budget as the youngest person ever to deliver it. What a moment. The moment you're thrust into the spotlight in the wake of a national emergency and you, be you become the nation's medical guru. Now I'm sure nearly everybody in here can name at least one of these people uh, if we went round the room to ask. People that we didn't know and then all of a sudden something changes and they're a household name. You see, some people are looking for fame, aren't they? Others have it thrust upon them. Why do some people have breakthrough moments and others don't? Talent, timing, luck? Well, we know there's no such thing as luck. As someone once said, it takes 20 years to make an overnight success. And today we're going to look at Jesus' moment when he breaks through into the public consciousness. Through the events that we've just read in Luke, we see a shift in Jesus' profile. Up until now, he's been building this almost like a group under the radar of disciples secretly, but not, not hidden. But all of a sudden, this, this teacher collecting student shifts to be a public figure. There's no going back from this point on. And by the end of the chapter, as we just read there, you've got the political leaders of his day dealing with this guy, this new person on the block, the Pharisees and the lawyers who hold a lot of control and influence over the people at that time. So the big idea for this talk this morning is that Jesus is the master of the house. Keep that in your mind as we go through it. Now, as Jesus bursts onto the scene, I want to look at some lessons, just a couple, in how we can live well. Even if we're never in the public eye, most of us are not household names in here. And probably none of us uh, will be. Who knows what the future holds? Maybe some of our children will be very famous. Who knows? But for most of us, we, we need still to live well, even if we're not in the public gaze, don't we? For the aim of life is not to be famous, but it is to live a worthy life. To live a life, as we said in the title, of purpose and poise, of contentment in Jesus. Well, maybe we do, we do something truly amazing and uh, maybe we, we pray and that God gives us a miracle and no one can deny that we've done a miracle or he's done a miracle through us. Surely people would be queuing up to hear our testimony to ask us how it happened. Well, maybe or maybe not because all of us, as we live our life in the public square, whether it be the schoolyard or the kitchen or the office or the football pitch, I think we can all learn from Jesus' approach in living this life of purpose, power, and poise whilst in the gaze of others. And the first thing to learn is that people will absolutely question your motives and your credentials, even if they can't deny your ability. People will question your motives and your credentials, even if they can't deny your ability. Jesus here does a clear miracle. He heals a demon-possessed man. In fact, if you look at Matthew's account, Matthew 12, uh, 22 and onwards, he has a similar, uh, same account, but told from Matthew's perspective. And Jesus shows amazing power to cast out this demon. And Matthew tells us that the man was actually blind and mute. Blind and mute. We're not told how he does it. It's a miracle. But the truth of the healing is self-evident because the guy who was blind and mute is now speaking. So they can't say it hasn't happened. It's definitely happened. The people were amazed, but some of them were distracted. When the party should be starting, all some of them want to do is hold an inquest. Who's this guy? 
Do you know him? I don't know him. Is he one of ours? Do we like him? And we, we see the question they're asking in Matthew is, could this be the son of David? They're starting to clock on with who Jesus is. But some of them have an alternative interpretation, a bit like uh, scientific evidence here. They're looking at the data and coming up with a different interpretation. They're saying it's the power of evil that this man is using, verse 15. And they demand, don't they, in verse 16, give us a sign that what you're doing is from God. So they're, at, they're asking for more and more evidence on what Jesus is doing. And the second thing we can learn is that we'll never keep everybody happy. Even if we do this amazing miracle, there's still people wanting more. Jesus is not concerned with being popular at all, really, but he is passionate for the truth. And Jesus uses this miracle to make a bigger point. And I want to look a little bit more at this term, Beelzebul. So I don't know if, you, if, if you'll be able to read this or not, but effectively, what, we, what this is a really interesting uh, history of this word and I want to just dig into this, so bear with me for just a couple of minutes because it's really, really fascinating. So basically, if you go back to ancient Israel, um, there was a Philistine god called Baal Zebel, right? Baal Zebel, which means Baal the Exalted, or Baal Master of the Height, or Baal Master of the Dwelling, right? So this was a Philistine god with uh, uh, this name. And then if you go back, actually doing a bit of dig into this, I found in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, it's really fascinating passage. When King Ahaziah, uh, Ahaziah falls, has a fall, and it says, uh, verse 2, 2 Kings 1, he says, Now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper roof in Samaria and injured himself. And he says, Go send messengers, saying to them, Go and consult Baal Zabub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. Elijah's not very happy about this. But that's what he does. He says, go and send messages to Baal Zabub. And then in Jewish tradition, this is actually twi a twisting of the Philistine name to Baal Zabub, meaning Lord of the Flies. Instead, it's not the house, master of the house, it's Lord of the Flies instead. Now roll forward, that's about 600 BC. If you roll forward 600 years to the New Testament now, so again, the, the name is, we think, changed slightly. And you've got a couple of occurrences of it in Matthew and Luke. And in Matthew, you have that verse where Jesus says, if they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign his household? So Jesus is saying here, if they call the master of the house the master of the house, how much more his servants? I'm the master of the house. They're calling me doing these things by Beelzebul. How much more you? who are my servants. That's what he's saying in Matthew 10, 25. And then in this passage here, he's getting accused of these, uh, by these Jews, saying you're doing it by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man is casting out demons. So they're basically saying, by, you're doing it by the, the power of the master of the dark forces, the prince of demons. You're, he's giving you power and you're casting out demons underneath his authority. That's what's going on here. So, but Jesus counters this with, he, again, he brings it back to a, a household, this idea of a household. He says a divided house will fall. No one can defy the master of the house unless, Jesus says, he's the new master of the house. There's a new master in town. That's what Jesus is declaring. I've arrived, everyone, and I'm here to overpower the big dog, the boss man. I'm taking over his patch. This is just the start, these demons being exorcised. And then he's saying to them, I am the master of the house. Did you see that in verse 20? Turn to this if you have your Bibles in front of you. This is the key verse uh, in, in this section, I, I, I believe. Jesus says in verse 20, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, this is a really significant phrase, the finger of God. And immediately their Jewish brains will be exploding because they'll be like, finger of God? We've heard that somewhere else before. And their mind would be going back to the Exodus. And if you know your Bible as well, you remember when Moses, God sent Moses back. You remember all those years ago and Moses went out into the wilderness for 40 years and we was trying to figure out what had gone wrong. And then God says, come back through the burning bush, come back and rescue my people. 
And Moses says, okay then. And God gives him these signs, his staff that turns into a serpent. And he says, go and confront Pharaoh. You're going to speak to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh refuses. And then God sends the first plague, the blood. And then he sends another plague. And you remember what happens at each point? The magicians, the evil magicians in uh, Egypt are copying the miracles. Do you remember that? They, they, they say, oh, look, we can make blood out of water. No big deal. It's not really a big plague. And then the next one happens and it's frogs. And they're, they're somehow, I don't know how, able to make frogs appear. And again, they're trying to replicate the plagues to show that this God is no big deal. We can do this as well. But then look, look if you, if you, want, to, if you want to turn to, if not, I'll read it out. Exodus chapter 8, verse uh, where are we here? 17. So 16, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. So Moses and Aaron did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on all the people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. And then when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since gnats were on the people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen just as the Lord had said. So we've got this amazing picture here of Moses standing before Pharaoh, the, the most powerful person in the world at that time, with the demand of let my people go. And the false musicians over in the corner trying to nullify Jesus', uh, Moses miracles at every step with their own dark arts. As each plague arrives, they try to replicate it. And it's only after the third plague that they go, game's up, we're, we're out of this one. And we, did you notice it when we read it? Which plague stumped them? Which plague was it? The gnats. And what are gnats? They're flies. They're flies. A new master of the house has arrived and Moses is declaring to Pharaoh, who's really in charge now, the God of Jehovah's in charge. The, the real Lord of the flies is sending the flies on Egypt that cannot be copied by the dark arts. And now Jesus is here saying it is the finger of God that these people who were doing witchcraft and dark arts and using the power of evil, even they knew it was the, the finger of God. They declared it. Now Jesus is saying, now today, if I'm using the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you right now. He announces the arrival of the moment for the liberation of God's people. And the finger of God points to this moment in history and says, the master of the house has arrived. He stands before Beelzebul. He casts aside his minions. He echoes the miracles of Moses. And he fulfills Isaiah 35, which we'll come back to at the end. So, I know you're all fascinated by the meaning of words in ancient Jewish history, but apart from being very interesting, what does all this mean to us? What does this mean for me today? What possible relevance can all this have in my life? Are the Pharisees flying blind or do they have a point? Well, if we think about last week and we build on what we looked at last week, the, you remember the boundless love and, and, the, and the bold devotion, these two things that we saw coming out last week, and we were centered in the presence and the power of God. Then this week passage shows us also two things, I believe. Firstly, that we will face opposition. We will face opposition. And secondly, that we need integrity. And through a series of encounters, Jesus takes us to the heart of what it means to live a life of purpose, power and poise. By zooming in on authority and authenticity. Who are we really? You see, in the first section of this passage, Jesus' own credentials are questioned. Who is this guy? His miracles are signed to the power of evil. In the last section that Megan read for us, we have him calling out the hypocrisy and the, the fakeness and the sham of these leaders. You see, this chapter is like a, a hinge point in this story. It marks the entrance of Jesus into public life. He's now a, a somebody. He's a known person. It signals a change in his ministry where he's no longer operating under the radar. He bursts onto the scene and faces the first real test in public life. And the application for us is worth considering today, isn't it? Because we've been pressured. 
We've, we've been pressured to privatise our faith, take it away from the public sphere. Yeah, you can do whatever you want in your homes or in your church buildings, but do not bring it into the public domain. That's what we've been told all our lives almost. And these passages show us that Jesus didn't shy away from engaging in public discourse. In fact, he embraced it. He welcomed it. He took them on in places with the wisdom of God. And I think there are lessons for us in how we engage in the marketplaces of life. You see, if last week we focused on the needs of various people, remember the need of the lawyer, we had the need of Martha and the need of the disciples, you remember that? Well, this week it's shifting to God's kingdom expectations. And I've listed just a couple of these for us to kind of focus in our minds. God's kingdom expectations. How does he expect us to survive and thrive when we're on the margins of society, when we've been pushed out to the edges? Well, I think firstly, when we, when we read through these verses, and we do have time to look at them all in depth, but if we, if we kind of look at them and we stand back a bit, we can see that he expects us to recognize the signs of the kingdom. Just as the Ninevites recognized the coming judgment of God and repented, He's expecting us to turn our lives towards the truth and to see the signs, especially the sign that Jesus is about to make of his own life as he goes to the cross. He's expecting us to sit at his feet and learn like Mary and just absorb that truth and devotion. He's, he wants to sit and learn like Mary. He expects us to treasure obedience. Remember what that lady said? She shouted out, Blessed are you, is the mother who gave birth and nursed you. No, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Treasure obedience, Jesus is saying. It's the family of God over family ties. That's what Jesus is saying. He expects us to bring our lives under his spiritual authority as the master of the house. And stay there, protected. Do you remember what it said there? That the demon flees and he doesn't know where to go. It's, it's weird imagery, really. It's like a demon wandering around going, I have no idea where I'm going to go. Uh, I know, I'll go back to the place I came from. It's this really bizarre imagery. And Jesus says he comes back and he found this really beautiful, pretty house. And what does he want to do? He wants to trash it. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to, Jesus wants us to remain under his spiritual authority and stay there. He expects us to be overflowing in love. We heard that in the Good Samaritan last week. We heard it in the children's talk today. Overflowing in love. And he expects us to live lives that are rock solid, root and branch, honest. Where there's nothing done for sure, but everything is an expression of the inner life. That is what he's saying to the Pharisees, isn't it? I mean, imagine someone saying these things to you. And just cutting right through your entire life as hollow. That's what Jesus is saying, root and branch, honest. Jesus is laying out the high calling of discipleship, of kingdom living, and he's fiercely confronting those false shepherds and false leaders and saying, you're a fake. He declares spiritual authority over every opponent, every opponent, and he stands before these leaders, the political and religious elite, and declares them a sham. He sees right through them to their man-made religion. But not only spiritual authority, he declares moral authority over every opponent. He has authority based on who he is, the son of God, almighty and everlasting. No beginning, no end, no higher power. But not only on who he is, but also on what he is as well. The sinless, perfect man, born into a world as a creature, living every single moment of every day to please his father. And as he stands before us this morning... Today, before all of us, and cries out, come to me, I am the real deal. I am the only truly worthy leader. I am the master of the house, the one able to defeat every enemy and protect every single one of my children. You see, the requirements for our discipleship is nothing other than the requirements Jesus places on himself and fulfills perfectly. He only asks us to be like, the, like him, and I know none of us this morning, we, if we're honest, know that we, we know we can't achieve this, don't we? None of us can get there. But we can ask him for help, can't we? Do you remember the traveller in last week's passage? 
when we were, we were encouraged to, to knock on the door in the middle of the night and say, give me some food, I'm desperate. That's the picture that God wants. He wants us to be desperate for him, for forgiveness, for purity, for love, for devotion. And will he turn us away? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We need only ask, only seek, only knock. His willingness to give is only constrained by our unwillingness to ask. You see, the Ninevites were shown here. They pleaded for forgiveness and they received it. The Queen of the South, we're told, traveled for days and days and days to hear Solomon's wisdom and she heard it. Are we less able to receive what we ask of God than they? Of course not. We must only look to him to cast, if you like, our gaze towards him for him to come running to our aid. And for those of us perhaps today, we've been a Christian for a long time and we're further down that path uh, of pilgrimage I think there are important lessons for us, isn't there, in this passage. Don't stop being filled with the Spirit. Don't rely on your spiritual feelings from years ago, from the testimony that you had when you were young. As I said earlier, the enemy is looking for nice, clean houses to come in and trash. Do not open the door and give the enemy a foothold in your life. Remember how quickly... The light within you can become darkness. Jesus uses the example of the lamp. What you look at, what you think about, what you dwell on will fill you. Seek the light. Stay away from the edge. Remove all temptations as much as possible. Also, he tells us, beware of respectability and reputation. When others start to defer to you, maybe they start to treat you as important, give you the best seats, then remember the priest and the Levite. Do you remember of the Good Samaritan in chapter 10? They were the respectable people and they totally fluffed it. Remember the Pharisee in this chapter? He starts off astonished and he ends up being ashamed. Pretense, formality, professionalism, a compartmentalized life, secret habitual sin, all of these are dangerous sinking sand better to be a nobody with a clean heart genuine love for God and others than to be a global evangelist speaking to millions and a false reputation how we have seen them fall recently do I need to remind you I don't want to depress us we have seen them fall over the last 18 months haven't we some of these big names you see, this morning, I have to be honest, we have an enemy who is desperate to steal your joy. We have an enemy who is desperate to take your job, to empty your soul, to ruin your reputation, to deaden your marriage, to estrange your family, to destroy your life. That is his agenda. He knows we can, he can never take our faith from us, but everything else is up for grabs. That's the battle that we enter every single day. So, in this, in this picture that we've created this morning, we have Egypt, we have the oppressed people of God, and we have Moses defying a Pharaoh. We have first century Israel, and we have people bound by superstition and evil powers, and Jesus denouncing the demons and all the hypocrites. And we have 21st century Scotland. We have God's people marginalized on the edge and being pushed further out who will stand up for Jesus in our day what does a fruitful life look like in public what does a life of purpose and poise look like for individual Christians in Perth in 2021 for you and for me looking at living as exiles in an anti-Christian society Steve's got the right book that is exactly the issues that are pushing us to the edges of society. What are we doing about it? Well, we started with breakthroughs, and I want to finish with a breakthrough as well. I've got a friend who uh, has, has entered primetime TV over the last couple of weeks. And uh, it, I don't know if you've been watching or not, but it's How to Improve Your Memory. And he's Dr. T, Dr. Taraka. He's a lovely, lovely guy that I've got to know over the last five or so years. 
And we have a prayer uh, WhatsApp where we share prayer, daily prayer groups with about 20 of us that started in Aberdeen. And he shared that he was going for filming. Uh, to, he'd, he'd got this part and he was going to be mixing with all these celebrities on the cast of How to Improve Your Memory. And he asked for prayer. And I wonder, or he asked for, uh, what advice we might give them. We'll get to his prayer in a second, but, you know, what might, entering show business, what would you say to someone entering show business? Be nice to everyone. Show business is a small world. Don't rock the boat. Stay safe in your opinions. Maybe that's what we would say. Well, this is the prayer that he asked us to pray for him. Can we pray that I find a depth of authentic connection with the Lord? So as I am on set and with the other cast, I would spread the presence of God. What about you? Well, I've got a couple of things. Sometimes we finish sermons. This is the second of my two. I'm kind of seeing them as a part of the same thing. We finish and we don't know what to do, right? So I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about. And if you're in your 20s or 30s today, I don't know if you are. Uh, I'm only just out of that bracket, unfortunately. So it doesn't apply to me, shucks. But if you're in your 20s or 30s, or you know someone who is in their 20s and 30s, and I don't know if you can read this, but basically this is a program set up by the Evangelical Alliance to try and support people who are in that kind of mid-early career phase of their lives to become the public leaders of the future. That first slide I showed, two of those people would have a Christian faith, Kate Forbes and Jason Leach. Who are the next generation coming through? This program is for people to mentor them, train them, encourage them. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone that, that you know. Think about it. If you want to know more, contact me or there's a, a Twitter address up there. Well, maybe you're not in your 20s and 30s, and I know looking at you, I can guess some of you probably aren't. But we're also, I'm involved in this group called Thrive, and some of you will have heard about this. It started in Aberdeen, and we're partnering with Blend in Dundee, Perth, and Paisley. We're coming to Perth, coming to a coffee shop near you. And what, what we're trying to do is we're asking the question, how can Christians thrive in the marketplace? And these, these gatherings, we want to create a gathering where we can share, empower, encourage people of all faiths, or in, no faith or all faiths. It's not just a Christian thing. But we believe that we're, we want to create a supportive environment for people to build relationships and for Christians to find their calling uh, as Christians in the workplace. If either of those are interesting to you, then let me know. I've also got one copy of Luke's Gospel uh, left, if anyone wants the journal. So as we, t as we finish our time together, what is Jesus saying to us as a collective body? I don't know where you are, where the elders and deacons are in your journey with, with, with Jesus. I don't know all the details. But my challenge to all of us this morning is, what is he saying to us as a collective body? What does fruitful living look like as a local expression of Jesus in this place, in Perth? The time for silence is over. The time for licking our wounds is over. The time for feeling sorry for ourselves is over. God wants our young men and women for himself in Scotland again. God wants our older and experienced men and women to rise up. God wants our children to know everlasting joy. I'm going to finish by reading Isaiah 35, verses 5 to 10. Then will the, you might see some references here that you recognize. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap, leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Thank you for joining us. 
To find out more about Tayside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.